application, just taking wholesale would seem to imply this, um, would seem to imply a, a polytheistic structure. Um, so how to modify Proclus's framework while preserving in some basic sense Proclus's insights in some way distinguishing between the unparticipated and participated um, becomes uh, an important issue um, from pseudo Dionysius, especially onwards, but in general, with most, as we see, most monotheist um, structures. Um, so, in some sense, how does one preserve, in other words, the distinction between non participated and participated without hypothesizing the difference? Um, and some of you here might be familiar with Edward Butler's work, who's very much uh, a rather strong proponent of the slightly controversial view of uh, taking the one as uh, not existing. So what you just have are the Hinads, uh, where he really wants to emphasize that one cannot envision the one as a distinct hypothesized principle in the way the Hinads are. Um, so in a sense, for Christians, it's kind of uh, the reverse problem here, uh, where one doesn't want to, um, as it were, hypothesize the participated attributes of God, and yet, in some sense, still respect those, um, respect some difference and how to cash out that difference. Um, yeah, so in that sense, this is where um, I was interested to look at and compare Nicholas and um, Aquinas um, and how they take this framework, um, both from Proposition 23, um, just where we see the basic structure laid out, um, and then in other connected propositions. Um, um, in as much as uh, they, in as much as one sees the sort of an attempt to deal with the different deal deal with the, the how exactly the distinction is cashed out, if there is any sort of distinction. Um, so, in this case, I focus on two so the two commentators, um, both Nicholas, Nicholas's commentary both on Proposition Twenty Three and other connected propositions. And Aquinas's comments on um, uh, sort of indirect comments on participation, um, primarily from the Libra de Causi's commentary, um, both so where both rely on pseudo Dionysius in responding to Proclus, however, in two distinct ways. Um, so, so something I wish to set out is where in this paper is where commonly both do away with Proclus's middle participator level. Um, so. Um, so both to do away with the middle part participator level between distinct entities. Um, so as it were, a real distinction or distinct realis. Um, so in one sense, they both agree that there are only, as it were, um, two really existent terms between the first cause, um, as it were, the first uncaused cause, um, and many participants in created beings. And both at the same time, in some respect, preserve um, um, a sense in which there is a middle term between God and creatures. Um, and it's also in this respect where they differ, um, as the, at least as so the absolute sum. So for Nicholas, the participated level is subsumed up into God. So creatures participate God directly or intrinsically. Um, and um, Nicholas also specifies this in certain places. Uh, in one particular passage I will focus on um, in terms of specific uh, aspects um, is these um, the illuminations or the lampses or lampses um, so that God as the illumination of goodness is participated or God as the illumination of being is participated um, yet in this sense God is not is not just that God is simply un, um, participated except in terms of these specific illuminations so in this respect, in one, in certain ways, Nicholas seems to make God, um, in some sense, analogous to um, um, partic the participated entities, um, as we see in Plotinus, where, where we just have a simple distinction between um, one participated source and many participants. Um, so, in this sense, um, like the Plotinian, um, the Plotinian principle, the one or intellect and soul. We have the same kind of causality at work between the different levels. Um, and so, um, and this is something that goes back to both um, pseudo Dionysius in some regards. Um, and it's also something I'm still interested to look into if there are additional sources for this Plotinian language we see uh, brought out in a few places in Nicholas. Um, so, in this sense, um, so yeah, while 
So while there is this case, Nicholas concurs with Proclus that the divine gives something of itself, um, albeit imminently with the illuminations. Um, and in this sense, he seems to follow a more literal reading of certain um, Dionysian passages, um, where Dionysius does seem to indicate um, uh, these imminent powers that are given by God. So all to say, basically, where Nicholas seems to subsume the participated level up to God, so God is both directly participated and yet, in as much as he has participated, God is transcendent. So God's participate. So participation in God is um, qualified by God's transcendence. And Aquinas, on the flip side, the participate level is subsumed into creatures. So creatures participate God extrinsically or indirectly via delimited essay. Um, that is through their imminent form. So for this, um, this follows on Aquinas' reading of the interaction between infinite and finite essay or finite um, being or finite ends. So any determination of essay is consequence or external to the principle of essay, which is infinite essay. So in, in some regard for Aquinas, God, is, um, God approximates more closely to um, Proclus's notion of the unparticipated, even while Aquinas still agrees that God is basically the first direct cause of um, the, uh, the property of essay or being um, in all perfections and creatures. Um, so here I'm just um, basically, so for just what I'll proceed is um, as you see in the handouts I distributed by email, um, I've divided the talk into three sections. And so I have text for each of those sections. And um, um, so I'm, I'm just giving this so, somewhat loosely, but we, um, I'll basically read to the, the end of first, the first section or each section. So yeah, I'll just begin with the first section just to give a background in Proclus and Pseudo Dionysius. Um, and then I'll just go into Nicholas and then Aquinas at the end. So to begin with Proclus, um, so yeah, so to begin with Proclus, um, so I'm sure most people probably have some sense of Proclus of uh, Proposition 23 kind of in the back of their minds. Um, but I will just go through and just briefly read a, um, a partic few particular sections in the um, proposition, uh, just to sort of revise our um, sort of revise our memory. <laughs> so yeah, just as I read the line, the main line of the proposition earlier, all that is participate brings to existence from itself the participated. Um, so and then I'll just read through the next paragraph. For the unparticipated, having the account of a monad just as it belongs to itself and not to another. <clears throat> and just as it transcends the participants, generates out of itself entities that are able to be participated. For either it will be established as unproductive by itself and it would have no honor, or it will give something from itself. And that which receives participates while what is given is brought to existence in a participated way. Metahomenos. And, in, and just on to the next paragraph. Every participated entity, on the other hand, becoming that which belongs to a certain particular, um, or to a particular tinos, by which it is participated, is secondary to that which is present in the same way to all, and has filled all things from itself. For that which is in one is not in the others, while that which is present to all in the same way, in order that it may illuminate to all, is not in one, but in but before all all things. And here I'll just skip to the um, to the bottom. Um, so, if it be in one out of all, it will no longer belong to all, but to one. If then that which is common belongs to those entities which are able to participate, and also that which is the same belongs to all, it will be prior to all, and this is the unparticipated. So um, here. In some sense, in some sense, this is being set up as a sort of an elaboration of um, both the traditional Platonic view of one form and many particulars in the backgrounds. And someone coming out of this background may wonder what's why I bring up this distinction in the first place. Why posits a distinction between the unparticipated and the participated here? Um, and so we see here in uh, one basic axiom or one basic premise uh, Proclus puts forward is that participation in each participant, each thing that participates, some property, common property, or some common term, um, 
is only participating in one specific thing for that thing. So the form of man that belongs to me or to Socrates or to Plato is going to be differentiated according to each individual. Um, and um, rather than one universal term, um, so man itself, so the, the source of the form of man in each particular would be something which is distinct. Um, so, um, so the proposition here, it's this is also following on um, the axiom Proclus lays in Proposition 21 earlier, where he claims that every order of entities, so posit-taxis, proceeds from a monad as a principle into plurality coordinated with the monad. And among every order, the plurality is carried back to one, to one monad. Um, so here, the, the picture we get is that um, plurality is produced directly from the producers and actively. So it's not simply a result of the reality of the participants. So in other words, the division between um, the form of man between Socrates, between myself and between Plato is not something which is just merely accidental to the material distinction between each of us, um, but it is something that's directly produced by the, by the, um, by the principle itself. Uh, we could say man itself. Um, and then of course carried up to higher levels of purpose that would be each souls, each soul belonging to, to myself or to Plato or Socrates must come from some one um, soul itself. But, um, but Proclus takes it that each um, particular soul belonging to each um, is not something that's to, the, the distinction between each soul is not something accidental to um, each material particular, but it's something anticipated by each. Um, So Proclus's proposition here recalls the sailcloth metaphor from Parmenides 131 um, B to C, um, where this is uh, here in your text, um, this is anticipating text six below in page two. Um, so where you have, where um, Parmenides, uh, the characters uh, establishes that it's, um, very, one difficulty he brings up is um, uh, Socrates, how neatly you make one and the same thing to be in many places. And it's as if you were to cover many people with a sail and they say that one thing is a whole is over many. <clears throat> um, and then of course it goes on to show how um, the sail as a whole would be over each person um, or, would, or would a part of it be over one person and another over another part. Um, and so of course the result is that it, um, conceived this way, forms themselves would be divisible and things that partake of them would partake of a part and no longer would have a whole part, a whole form, but only a part of it and would be in each. So, um, <clears throat> so the idea seems to be that each man, each form of man is, um, even if it's the same um, essential property conveyed by each, um, is going to be specified or limited by, um, by the part um, so that each, each man's form or each man, the soul belonging to each man is going to be a limitation and specification that you can't find in another participants or another, um, uh, another order, uh, yeah, another participant effectively. Um, so yeah, effectively Proclus seems to concede the premise and the critique of the form in the participants necessitates this distinction or division. Um, while maintaining at the same time the form's primal transcendence as undivided. So on the one hand, he accepts that there will be division, but, he can see, but at the same time, um, still admits that even if you do have this division, there still has to be some cause of unity over and above the partition into parts. Um, so this goes hand in hand with plurality, a distinction anticipated from the producer's ends. That is that the participator produces um, something um, participated rather than so like from the participants end as in um, Plotinus um, or what one might think is this uh, a more basic um, more traditional platonic view. Um, so the application of this principle of course um, uh, so for Proclus the application of this principle you can see carried over to the basic tree principle view that you have from Plotinus between uh, one soul and many souls, uh, one intellect and many intellects, and then of course up to the one itself, the distinction between the one by itself to out to n, um, the one in itself and many hanads um, or hanades 
many um, particular ones derived from the one. Um, and of course, this is embodied in Proposition 116, where every goddess uh, participated except the one, every goddess metectos in the sense. So just to, to give the background with Proclus here, um, now to transition to Pseudo Dionysius, um, where we see this collapse, as it were, between the unparticipated and participated. Um, and this is uh, summed up, you can see, in um, the De Divinis Nomidibus uh, 510 and 25, and text T2 and T3 on the handouts, um, and then also later on at T10, which I'll go over later. Um, so just to briefly read T2, um, uh, for in unity, as is often said, God precontains and brings to existence all beings inasmuch as he is present to all things and everywhere in himself by unity and in the same way as totality and inasmuch as he proceeds to all things and remains in himself as both resting and moving and as neither resting nor moving nor as possessing beginning, middle, or, nor ends and neither in some particular among beings nor being a particular among beings and so on. So here um, in this text in 510, um, uh, one should note the parallel to Proposition 122, so which I just, um, I just quote the header in um, T4, um, all that is divine both exercises providence over secondary entities and transcends the products of providence, since its providence neither involves remission of its unmixed and unitary transcendence, nor does its separate unity annul its providence. Um, and so the key distinct, the distinct feature here is um, one can see both in this passage from, uh, from Dionysius as well as from 122 um, is the confluence of both the participated status of um, the, ent the principle in question, specifically either the Henats or Proclus um, or God in the case of Dionysius. So Proclus similarly phrases the mix of positive and negative attribution to the divine, to the divine um, or to the Henads. Um, and in the same way, Dionysius ultimately seems to adapt that language in his description of God's transcendence and paradigmatic imminence in a language of um, moving and resting and also neither moving nor resting. Um, so in this sense, I'm, in this sense, I sort of take a reading of Dionysius more or less closely following Timothy Riggs, um, um, who claims that Dionysius uh, is more kind of sticking with the language of Henads. Um, it's also something that Dan, Christina Dancona also um, reads with Dionysius. Um, so I don't think, it's, at least my reading is it's not so much that you see a, a, a mere collapse between the first and second hypotheses of the Parmenides as more you can see Dionysius using, um, taking this reading of the Henads um, from Proclus of places like 122, um, and as much as they're both anticipating features of being and where you see the positive attributes uh, applied to the Henads. Um, so that's from the second hypothesis in that sense. And yet at the same time, they still um, contain in themselves um, the principle of unity um, in which you see the negative attributions from the first hypothesis passed on to the Henads in their um, subsistence as, as one. Um, so just as a brief parenthetical note. Um, yeah, so that's um, looking at T, text T2 in relation to 2022. Also in text T3, um, just reference it for now, um, Dionysius seems, pseudo Dionysius seems to accept Proclus's premise that plurality is anticipated on the, on the producer's side, um, and namely in terms of this language of um, divine differentiation. Um, um, yeah, and uh, is, I, I'll, just, I'll just read the passage here. So divine differentiation is in the eminently good processions of the divine unity, which both increases and multiplies having made itself transcendently one by its goodness. <clears throat> and the things united are through the divine differentiation, things imparted without relation, substantializations, vivifications, wise makings, and other gifts belonging to the goodness of the cause of all things, by which the quote, unparticipably participated, uh, the, so the tam amathectos, the, the humana, 
or hymns from the participants and participated things. So Pseudo Dionysius here seems to accept Proclus's premise that plurality is anticipated on the producer side. Um, in some sense, the following premise of Proposition 23 is still granted um, in terms of uh, namely where the unparticipated um, will give something from itself and that which receives participates while what is given is brought to existence in a participated way. Um, so in some sense, that, that line is something that you see in some sense, it seems to be st uh, still preserved in Dionysius. Um, and it's also brought to bear in the phrase of the, um, uh, the Almefectos Metahomena uh, towards the end of T3, which Nicholas makes much use of in his critique against Proclus. And then finally to note, um, Dancona, Christina Dancona significantly notes how Dionysius, together with the author of the Liber de Causis, uh, returns to the language of Plotinus in describing the first principles causality. Um, so in a 1996 article in the Cambridge Companion to Plotinus, um, Dancona lays out um, sort of a transition from the Plotinian conception of causality from the one where she sees the one's causality as um, proportional to the kind of causality seen at the intelligible level. Um, she sees a sh transition from that to uh, one in Proclus where there's a division between um, sort of concordance with the unparticipated participate distinction, um, uh, a distinction between uh, the one's production, um, the one's production or the Hinnes production of being um, by their um, priority to being and the production the causal, causality as it applies to the intelligible realm. Um, and here I'll just summarize um, where she seems to see Dionysius as kind of going back to this Plotinian um, position. Um, so she says that um, Dionysius endorses the, the basic Plotinian tenets about the transcendence of the principle as a correlative of its omnipresence. So God is conceived of as overflowing in all creatures and at the same time remaining in himself. As with the, the Proclean Henads, the Dionysian God is everywhere by means of his providence and his capacity to comprehend in himself all the lower entities is qualified by his transcendence. So once again, one can see that this is sort of following from um, Proposition 122 and the description of the Henads exercising providence at the same time as their, that, that providence and knowledge of creatures or of, of um, of beings is qualified by their transcendence as um, pure <clears throat> as pure unities. So, and additionally here, Dionysius drops the distinction. Uh, so this is something that comes out in 122, um, which I also quote at the end of um, T4. So, um, so where we you do see this distinction between um, causality auto to ani, so there's um, auto to ani, which applies just to the intelligible realm. That is, that causality happens by each principle's um, own being, and auto to pro um, uh, which applies just to the henads. So the henads produced by their priority to being uh, the malum de pro um, So then, so also, so here by contrast, Dionysia seems to drop the distinction between um, with auto to pro and just sticks to the language of auto to ani for God. Um, so there's that additional factor that one sees in this kind of return to the sort of Plotinian picture, just generally speaking in Dionysius. Um, and that seems to be something that at, at play, I think, in um, some of this language one sees recurring also in Nicholas and his use of Plotinus um, in describing kind of cashing out the picture of uh, participation we get from Dionysius in responding to Proclus. So to recap here, um, on the one hand, Dionysius seems to return to the Plotinian picture of the first transcendence as coextensional, in a sense, uh, or conditions with its status as participated. On the other hand, at the same time, Dionysius still seems to concede the, the Proclean picture of participation as something given from the producer side, rather than passively realized in the participant side, as in Plotinus, which we will see ahead. Um, so in this sense, um, yeah, so in this sense, on the one hand, while there is a collapse that one sees in a sense, uh, while the first anticipates, um, so while, while, while the first is um, directly participated by beings um, and, is, and remains transcendent at the same time, 
um, you still find indications where the first, um, so the reference to the providential powers implies a kind of imminent, um, there's still there's still the acceptance of um, from um, Proposition 23 of the notion of um, participation given with respect to creatures um, with regards to these specific powers. Um, and then that's something that again, um, uh, something that again does be to that we'll see cast out to, or brought up again in, in Nicholas and Methoni. Um, so this is just by way of a general sketch between Proclus and then uh, what we see the transition in Pseudo Dionysius um, and then how that will we'll see that cashed out between Nicholas and Aquinas. Right, so yeah so with this sort of with this background now I'll go into Nicholas. Um, so um, just to briefly mention as well too for those not familiar with Nicholas's commentary. Um, uh, so the title of the work is um, it's rather telling it's the Anaptuxis Tis Theologi Geekies, stoichiosis, stoichiosis, um, so the refutation, or I think Joshua's translation, I, I don't know if this is updated in your recent edition, but in the first edition it was explication. So I guess a couple different ways to cash it out. Um, it's the, effectively the style of the commentary is set up as a sort of, um, uh, in a sense it is a kind of, sort of a set up as a refutation sort of genre. Um, so, uh, effectively, the whole work is con is constructed around a sort of defense of uh, Christian um, philosophical theological position over and against the dangers of a pagan like Proclus leading the faithful way uh, in dangerous ways of thinking uh, away from the faith. Um, so, of course, the, so the commentary in a way, in a sense, is um, qualified with that sort of, um, in a sense, with that sort of slant. So in reading um, Nicholas's commentary and his own particular responses, one has to kind of carefully weed through um, some of the rhetorical layer. Um, so yeah, so anyway, with that, just a sort of a background. Um, so here I will read through um, T5. Uh, so where I focus particularly on Nicholas's philosophical critique of participation. Um, so from T5 from the handout page two, um, for Proclus seems to fear less than saying that the one and whole is participated, he might divide it corporeally, so somaticos, and might no longer preserve it whole and one, where in fact the one voice, which is heard by many, is divided and is divided in this way and becomes participated, even though it is corporeal, nevertheless is participated as a whole by each of the hearers and not just by part of it, by this one, and part of it by that one. And the one concept, noima, the teacher, even though it subsists in the lowest state of intelligibles, nevertheless, although divided by impartation um, to many students, it is participated in each of them as a whole and the same, and remains the same whole in itself and the teacher, no less than if it were unparticipated. <clears throat> so, um, so here it's notable that um, that uh, Nicholas uses the language of somaticos uh, in his critique of Proclus in conceiving of the participated in this way as corporeal. Um, so here clearly it, seemed, it brings to mind Parmenides' sailcloth metaphor with an implicit critique of thinking of the form in this sort of corporeal way. Um, so, and this also, but this is something I didn't quite, I haven't yet looked at as, um, there are also critiques sort of along these lines in both Plotinus um, and uh, there's a part of in Proclus also where he also disagrees with uh, the aporia to think of um, the division and the sort of, it's not exactly somaticos but something similar to that term. So that's one thing I'd like to look back at. Um, so there's a sense in which Nicholas is drawing back on this, this kind of response. Um, but it's notable here that uh, um, he seems to take this more, uh, take this a bit further in denying, as, as a reason to deny the distinction between unparticipated and participated here, or of conceiving the participated in the way that um, Proclus does, and um, that each entity participated by each um, participant is only respective to that one um, and not to another. Um, so also here, Nicholas's examples are telling between the speaker, analogous to Proclus's monad, and the listeners, analogous to the participants, 
both that mode as characteristic effect. Um, the one voice, the he, the he, mi e fune, which is received in exactly the same state <clears throat> as that which is given by the speaker. Uh, the concepts no is shared between the teacher and the students is, is essentially the same and not divided into distinct entities. So here there seems to be, a, um, so here on, on, one, on the one hand, there seems to be um, an assertion in different first principles of what participation entails, namely where the participative property is the same and not different between participants A and B. So distinction and division is purely on the participant side. In other words, the, um, the form we could say, or the principle, um, the division is, is uh, purely accidental to the form or to the principle participated, and it's not essential to the participated entity in question. So in the sense against Proquis. And the property conveyed between the source and the participants, so in this, in this picture from, from, from Nicholas is numerically the same. Whereas in Proclus's view, the property conveyed is numerically different. So one might ask here, why reject Proclus's um, basic premise um, for the unparticipated? So why not? And so why should we accept that um, there is not some kind of real distinction between <clears throat> the form of man, the form of man that I have, versus the form of man that Socrates has or Plato has, um, or in turn. Um, um, in turn, also, why, why not say that, um, that the soul that I possess is something numerically distinct from, from, another, from, from Socrates and from other men? Um, it, it's not clear if, I mean, of course, to be fair, it's not clear if um, how far Nicholas may be thinking this way. Um, but with this picture participation that we have from Nicholas in critiquing Proclus, one might have these sorts of questions. Um, so, for example, the concept communicated to the students is um, participated. But the source of the concept, the teacher him or herself, is not participated as such. So the contention lies in different, um, so it seems here the contention lies in um, a different conception of what participation entails. Um, so where in this case for Nicholas, um, it's enough just to say that the thing that each man participates or that each entity participates is numerically one entity. Um, and in the case of the um, the concept communicated to the students, you have one and the same concept taken all together. Um, and a case like that would seem to be a bit more clear, perhaps, um, uh, just while bracketing or leaving aside uh, talking about individual souls, for example. Um, and that, in my mind, that's still sort of a question. But, um, um, but one can see here, at least there's a, one can see here that there's a different first principle accepted about what um, participation is entailing. Um, whether each thing, what 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 um, what each participant effectively um, partakes in, um, in this case. So Nicholas's language regarding participation here, we can see it goes back to pseudo Dionysius, in the language of five ten um, back in T two, um, with God implicitly participated as present to all things and everywhere, parvon tois pasi kai pantahu. Um, and the specific metaphors, so here are the specific metaphors to Proposition 23 um, from um, Nicholas's commentary on 23 uh, presents a striking parallel um, to Plotinus's description of participation in, in an Eid 6.4. Um, and the, some, the, some of the particular metaphors that Plotinus draws out in these passages, there's uh, at least one, there seems to be a rather striking parallel. Um, so for example, um, yeah, so it's, uh, the general context from 6.4 um, is, is Plotinus's claim that being, or uh, we terms the true wall, to anything known pan is present everywhere and exists as a whole in relation to entities in the world of becoming, which are mere imitations of the all. Um, so he's trying to give an account for how one can speak of being as present everywhere while at the same time accepting that there are divisions um, in the material world um, and how you can still have one of the same um, form of being or the same, yeah, the form, same form of being everywhere. So with that in mind, here I read um, text T7 um, from 643. But where all the powers are, soul itself is clearly present, being in the same way separate. 
For if it became the form of this particular thing, to the Eidos, it would have departed from being all and being everywhere in itself, all belonging incidentally to another. But it belongs to no thing which wishes to belong to it, but as far as it can approaches whatever it itself wishes, not by becoming, not by its becoming to belong to that, nor again to anything else, but by the desire of that for it. There is nothing therefore surprising in its being in all things in this way, because it is also in none of them in such a way as to belong to them. And so typical Plotinian language sort of kind of drawing around to the, um, sort of drawing around in a sense, the, the thing he's trying to communicate. Um, so yeah, from this passage, um, in some sense, the language should be familiar for those who can recall Plotinus's claim um, elsewhere where um, soul is not in body, but rather the other way around, body's in soul. Um, so participation here lies on the side of the participant um, bodies approaching their cause. Um, so in the term he has, um, pelaxe, uh, approaching their cause of soul. So soul does not directly act on participants in this regard, but it instead exercises its causal action the other way around through the participant's desire for it and approaching it. And so here one can see um, this juxtaposition with Proclus's framework um, um, in as much as uh, by contrast, of course, we see the participated something or the, um, yeah, the participated something directly produced from the one source um, that there's an anticipation rather than um, the one form just simply drawing multiple partic particulars into one. Um, so one might ask with Proclus's framework in the background, um, why not have distinct participated powers, for example, uh, since the passage brings up powers where the powers are, well, so why not have this distinction between powers and um, soul itself as remaining unparticipated, the picture we, we get in, in Proclus. Um, and earlier before this passage in lines one to six, Plotinus raises this possibility directly, but ultimately, ultimately rejects it. Um, since, as our passage shows, powers are not separated from soul itself. Um, so Plotinus has a strong reading of the numerical identity between um, powers and their source. Um, so in effect, where one sees um, the power of life in something that's directly indicating the source itself is imminently present to the thing or to the being. Um, and so here, um, yeah, so here in this in this regard, we can see sort of uh, at least this this sort of line of thought in the background with Nicholas um, in the way that he's describing and constructing participation as something um, the entity participated, something present everywhere and as a whole, and that does not and need not imply this division into part into um, different things, and that even where you do have distinct powers or distinct instantiations that directly points to the presence of one entity or one principle um, as such. Um, so I mean, at least as in, in that regard, one sees um, sort of that general line of thought in the background. Um, text T8 um, in particular is a sort of parallel also with um, Nicholas's description or Nicholas's metaphor with the one voice, the miophone. Um, so yeah, parallel to Plotinus comparing participation to um, sun and the rays of light from the sun. I'll also read the, from T8. For with the sun also you can say, once the light shines over all the air by looking at the body of the sun, but nonetheless you see the same light everywhere. And this light is not divided into parts either. And the cuttings off of lights make this clear. They do not allow it to be on the other side of them from that whence it came, but they do not divide it either. And certainly then, if the sun was only a power which was without a body and gave light, the light would not have begun from there where the sun was. And you would not be able to say whence it came, but it would be everywhere as one and the same. It would have no beginning and no starting point anywhere. So in both cases, um, both cases here from Plotinus's metaphor uh, example, and also from the, the example with Nicholas of the one voice, um, the corporal examples um, show that the, the entity 
so that the corporeal examples of the one voice, the light, um, as divided, are accidental to are accidental features, as it were, to the thing. But in itself, they remain as a whole and everywhere one and the same. So for Nicholas, um, the homos holy, uh, so remaining as a whole, and Spuplotinus being pantahu ken kai telton. And so here we can also note the emphasis at the end of um, at the end of six four seven from C eight of the light as a power being present everywhere, even if someone took away the body of the sun. So here there's an emphasis on the simultaneity of the form itself and the power is present from the form in participation. Um, again, something that's a consequent drawn out from um, the earlier 643 um, text T7. So here in this case, um, Nicholas seems to paint a similar picture here um, in as much as, um, in as much as uh, the same dynamic one sees of the one voice communicated between the source um, and the participants receiving the, the one voice, um, one of the same powers present in all or among all. Um, so also note the parallel here um, in the um, principal soul, um, or we could also say the form not belonging to any one particular or another. Um, so this would also be similar to Nicholas's emphasis. Um, this is, uh, also not, not quoted in the earlier text, but uh, Nicholas's emphasis that divine persons, the divine persons of the Trinity are participated together, but they do not belong to any or um, any or all of their participants. And this comes just after um, just after the bits the, from text T5. So so while there are these um, so generally just to, while there there's this there are these some of these parallels um, um, to the sort of Platonian description of participation in the background. Um, here, I just wish to show um, where there's this general line of thought being drawn back from Plotinus um, and drawn in again to um, Nicholas's critique and uh, uh, critique of Proclus and his own alternate um, picture of participation in cashing out pseudo Dionysius. Um, here, I just merely wish to claim that there is this sort of um, um, parallel of thought um, what I'm not so sure about, and this is something I would look forward to with some feedback, is um, to what degree, um, where exactly he gets this language of the, the neophone, um, and, and, and as much as how much of that could be drawn from um, directly or indirectly from the analogy of the sun and the light rays from Plotinus. Um, and something I haven't done yet that I want to do more afterwards is um, to see if we see this similar sort of metaphor back in either the Cappadocians, um, possibly Gregory of Nyssa, or um, um, also comments on participation to this um, degree or this effect in um, Michael Solos and John Italos. And that's something I still have to go look into and see how much there may be some line of thought coming back from them um, in, in Nicholas's description here. Um, but yeah, just something to brackets as well, well, um, at least noting this sort of parallel. So given that there is this, um, there is the parallel to Plotinus or to this picture from Plotinus of participation, um, there is a notable contrast to the Plotinian picture in Nicholas, um, specifically with um, the participated aspects um, via illuminations. So um, the degree to which Nicholas draws on um, uh, Pseudo Dionysius from text T3, for example, from 2.5 and from other passages similar to that. Um, so for example, here we can read from text T9. Um, yeah, so just uh, from quoting here, so where, where one se seems to see this picture of, um, so well, on the one hand, participation, um, one of the same principles participated, there are still distinct aspects of that one and the same principle um, um, participated by each participant. So whether there's this sort of subtle difference from Plotinus, here it'll just read from T9. So, but in saying that there is one principle um, and super princi principial monad, and that all the illuminations proceeding from it are both perfect and perfective of the things that receive them, we avoid the aforementions uh, aforesaid absurdity, we confess the principial monad itself is participated in this way and present to all. 
and we preserve it as separate and unparticipated. For it is present to all things purely, undefiledly, and unsubscribably, and it precontains and supercontains all things by causality and incomparable transcendence. Um, um, and gushes forth from all things from itself on account of its abundant goodness. Um, and I'll just skip down to, um, let's skip down towards the end. So since it defines and limits and perfects all things by excessive power through the perfective illuminations that proceed from it, through which it is present to all and is participated by all, though itself remaining separate and unparticipated. So here, it's notable that participation here is qualified. Um, so God has participated um, in respect of the illumination sent out, um, so only in terms of causal, the causal relation to created beings that God has participated. Um, incidentally, this passage uh, should have explained at the beginning, um, follows on, um, uh, so th this passage follows on Nicholas's commentary on Proposition 81, where Proclus distinguishes between um, two participated entities, um, between the separately participated and um, an eminent participated power generated by that separate entity uh, within the participant. So another, this is basically a generalization of Proposition 80, where um, Proclus establishes that um, bodies act only in virtue of some incorporeal power implanted in them and that that incorporeal power as such has to go back to some distinct entity, which is pure, which is, um, um, which doesn't have any association um, with body. So it's, um, it's all subsisting in that regard. And then in 81, Proclus generalizes that principle. Um, so there is this sort of distinction between um, what is imminently participated, that is the power of life in a given living body um, and that the source of that power of life has to go to a principle which is um, purely separate, um, horizos. Um, and so, yeah, here Nicholas, and uh, incidentally also, um, Proclus also describes um, that power as, as an illumination as well. So that's where also there, at least if I recall right anyway, so in, this, that's, in another sense, that's where this language of um, illumination is also coming from here. Um, as well as drawing on the pseudo Dionysian um, terminology of uh, illumination as well. Um, so yeah, so in this sense here, um, so to go back to the, to, uh, the context, um, so in, in um, Nicholas's description of participation here, um, plurality is anticipated in the producer side, that is in God in relation to the participants um, so rather than passively, in the, the kind of picture we see from Plotinus, um, where participants merely approach the form as it is. Um, so in this respect, one sees in the, in the background um, um, Pseudo Dionysius, um, both from text T3 and again below text T10, I'll just, which I'll just reference here when, Proclus, when um, Dionysius speaks of being itself, life itself, and divinity itself, um, where he respects that that's um, each of those terms may indicate distinct um, powers, but they ultimately go back to one numerical source or principle. Um, yeah, so in that respect, so to this limited degree, Nicholas seems to agree with Proclus in the sense that the participated is given to the participants by its source. Um, yet at the same time, that does not mean that a real distinction obtains between the source and the participated. Um, so, exactly how to describe this is still something I'm sort of trying to, I guess, figure out. But um, at least in this picture we see from Nicholas and in turn drawing on Pseudo Dionysius, God gives himself under specific aspects. Um, that is with these, uh, the perfective illuminations, um, yet remains unparticipated in remaining prior to these illuminations. So in this sense, we still have the kind of agreement back to the Platonian picture of um, direct participation in the, in the separate source. Um, so that, that does imply imminence, <clears throat> while at the same time that, that participation is conditioned by um, the principle's transcendence. Um, 
So in, this, in that respect, you see the platinum picture um, brought back and also the picture we see of the Hinats from um, propositions like 122 and Proclus. While at the same time, there's a concession that there are still um, these distinct participated aspects brought out in one, in one principle, which is a concession back to Proclus in that regard. And then, yeah, this is something we can see again coming back from the pseudo-Dionysian backgrounds um, in Nicholas. So to conclude here for at least Nicholas, um, on the one hand, Nicholas uses language, the language of pseudo-Dionysius to critique Proclus's framework um, you know, in terms of uh, having to distinguish between many separate principles um, directly participated and the one separate source where both pseudo-Dionysius and especially Nicholas uh, would say that one and the same principle is both directly participated in distinct ways and yet one and the same. Um, the kind of alternate framework and metaphors used leads close to Plotinus's own conception of participation, um, as mentioned earlier. Um, and of course, with this important qualification of the illuminations. So this suggests that Nicholas preserves in some distinction between God as unqualified, um, in some sense analogous to Proclus as unparticipated, and God as qualified through these illuminations, um, analogous to Proclus as participated. Um, and at the same time, um, yeah, and I say all that, of course, well, um, in terms of the connection to, Pro to, to um, Plotinus, that's the, the, the qualification of how much uh, Nicholas is actually drawing on um, Plotinian source or how much of this is just drawing on a general line of thought um, uh, that goes back to this sort of Plotinian um, conception is something I'm still trying to draw out. Um, so that would conclude, um, looking at Nicholas by himself. Um, so I'll just go into my final section. Uh, right. It seems hopefully we'll have enough time. Um, yeah, so for Aquinas, um, contrasting Aquinas with Nicholas in this reading of, of um, participation. Um, so of course, I'm seeing here that a lot of people are reworking on the Libra de Causis commentary. Um, so as far as I can, I've seen, there isn't a specific discussion on 23 in itself in um, the commentary, except inferentially, um, so in contrast to Nicholas. Um, and so of course here I'm just following um, wherever um, Aquinas discusses participation from Proclus and the Platonici um, in, in connection, any in connected propositions to 23. And so one start on this would be proposition six from the Libra de Calzis um, and Aquinas' commentary on it. Um, which gives, where Aquinas gives this gloss on the framework from 23. Um, so, and just to give a brief background, um, the Dicarosi's author or authors prove um, from Proposition 6 that the first cause is beyond description and only described through secondary causes. So as Aquinas recognizes, this proposition is itself an adaptation of the elements, um, Proclus's elements, Proposition 123, where Proclus establishes the same principle, um, except for all that is divine, pantotheon, rather than just specifically the first principle, by implication referring to the plurality of gods, um, rather than just the first cause, as with the Libra de Causis. Aquinas thus gives his interpretation of the threefold structure between the first cause, the gods, um, what Aquinas refers to as essential being, uh, quote ends, following Merbeck's translation of Tothion. Um, and the participants. And here I'll just quickly read through uh, text T11. Um, now by essential being, quote ends, Proclus understands every ideal form in accord with the Platonist positions, such as man itself, life itself, and the rest of the sort, which they call gods, as was said above. Furthermore, according to them, things of this sort have super substantial unity because they surpass all participating subjects. Thus he says that none of them can either be expressed or known by things below them, but they can be known by things above them. For example, the idea, the idea of life can be known by the idea of being, but although they cannot be perfectly known or expressed by lower things, still they can be grasped and known in some way, quote from what participates them, um, that is through the things that participate them just as through those things that participate life, something is known about life itself. 
but what is absolutely first, which according to the Platonists is, is the very essence of goodness, is entirely unknown because there's nothing above it that can know it. Such as what Proclus means by um, amethectum, uh, Latinized, that is, not existing after non protest, non post existence. Uh, so, not existing after anything, in other words. Um, right, so in this passage, um, so uniquely in this passage, Aquinas understands the unparticipated as the principle which is not known uh, by a prior intellect or principle, and so it has no principle before us. While he recognizes one aspect of being unparticipated from Proclus, that is indicating the origin of, um, of a property or a given causal chain, Aquinas does not explicitly comment on another aspect of being unparticipated, that is belonging to itself and not to another, um, the additional qualification um, in relation to the participants. Aquinas at least seems to recognize this implicitly in his interpretation of amethectum in his use of Merbeck's gloss on tolomethekton from the Greek as non post existence, namely where the unparticipated does not belong or can be found in its participants. Similarly to what we saw with Dionysius above, Aquinas afterward recognizes that the Liber de Calzi's author, um, like, the, like Dionysius, treats the first principle in a sense like a henad, um, as in Proposition 122. So intermediate between, so as an intermediate between being completely transcendent according to its mode of existence and yet knowable through participants as their cause. So kataitian, it's knowable. So Aquinas recognizes the similarity in approaches between the Decalises and Dionysius, going back to Proclus, at least in this very general respect. We find Aquinas' implicit rejection of Proclus' distinction between the unparticipated and participated at the end of his commentary on Proposition 6 from the Decalises. So it's implicit when he denies, according to the truth, um, that there is a, a certain one above being itself. Um, and here reading from T12 on page five. According to the Platonists, however, the first cause is above being inasmuch as the essence of goodness and unity, which is the first cause, also surpasses separated being itself. So for ipsum and separatum, as was said. But according to the truth, the first cause is above being inasmuch as it is infinite to be, so ipsum esse infinitum. Being, that is, ends, however, is called that which finitely participates to be, uh, so participates esse. And it is this which is proportioned to our intellect, whose object is some that which is, um, as it is said in um, De Anima 3. Hence, our intellect can grasp only that which has a quiddity uh, participating to be essay, but the quiddity of God is essay is to be itself. Thus, it is above intellect. In this way, Dionysius presents the arguments from chapter one of the Divinis uh, Nomidibus, saying, if all thoughts are of existing things, and if existing things are limited, namely, inasmuch as they finite, finitely participate to be, who is above all substance, is set apart from all knowledge. Well, yeah, so of course here Aquinas is speaking in the context of knowledge of our intellects um, with regards to um, the first. However, this is an application of participation here. So we thus know being, and in this regard participate being, only in virtue of the aptitude of created intellects for finite being. So um, taking this as an ap as a, um, application of the principle of participation in the sense Participation here is from the participants end, um, as I understand Aquinas here. So what is received as finite essay, um, finite being here, or to be in created um, intellects and beings. So participation from the recipients end is brought out, um, it's brought out more in um, Thomas's commentary on the Decalzi's Proposition 4. Um, and here I'll just quickly read through T13. Um, then, um, when he says, the author of the Decalzi says, it became many only, he shows the reason for the distinction that there can be an intelligence is, 
according to lessons. Here we ought to note that if there is some form or nature altogether separate and simple, no multiplicity can occur in it as if there were some separate whiteness, there would be only one. Now many diverse whitenesses are found that participate whiteness. In this way, therefore, if first created being were abstract being as the Platonists maintain, such being cannot be multiplied, but would be one only. But because first created being is being participated in the nature of an intelligence, it can be multiplied according to the diversity of those that participate it. So here we see plurality results according to the diversity of the participants, um, which in one sense was also seen in Proclus from um, the elements proposition 23, in as much as the unparticipated generates participated entities corresponding to the number of participants. However, what's unique here in Aquinas's account is that plurality results, um, at least as I read it, solely from the participants' ends. So plurality is not something that is um, anticipated or produced on the separate principles' ends, um, but it's merely consequence on the, um, the ontological status of the participants. The latter becomes one reason um, Aquinas emphasizes later in his Proposition 4 commentary that distinction or diversity of any kind cannot be found in God. Um, and reading here from text T14, um, um, further on in the uh, commentary, the Platonists held that there were separate forms of things through whose participation intellects became intelligent in act, just as through and participation of them, corporeal matter is constituted in this or that species. But the result is the same if we hold for many separate forms but in place of them all search one first form from which all else is derived, as was said above in regards to the opinions of Dionysius, which the author of this book seems to follow when he does not place any distinction in divine being. So since the intelligences are diverse in essence, as was said above, intelligible participative forms must be diverse and different in the diverse intelligences just as the diverse participated forms in the sensible worlds are also found according to the di diversity of individuals that participate them. So on the one hand, we find Aquinas once again following Proclus's notion that participated entities correspond to the number of participants. Yet unlike Pro Aquinas, or sorry, unlike Proclus, Aquinas takes the term participated to mean the received property in participants not what is given on the form or the principal side, that is in the plurality of the separated forms or the plurality posited in divine being as with Proclus' sin as. So here we can compare with Plot um, Plotinus's or Nicholas's emphasis that division results um, purely from the participant side. Um, consequently, Aquinas seems to rule out any kind of distinction that can be found in divine being, namely in God. For Aquinas, God's existence as the first cause necessitates a notion of pure unity that rules out any implicit or anticipated distinctions which are manifested in the eminent properties generated in created beings, an intuition which he follows both from the Libre de Causis or, and um, ultimately Proclus's own understanding of the, the unparticipated. This seems to go further in Pseudo-Dionysius than, than Pseudo-Dionysius um, from what we saw in T10 from the De Divinis Nominibus 11.6, um, um, and also from Nicholas and T9, um, in both cases where um, both seem to imply some kind of imminent um, uh, distinction in God, namely in terms of the multiplicity of um, powers, even if not, even if there isn't a real distinction or uh, distinction realis, um, but the diversity of the providential powers imminent in God. Um, so, you know, of course, whether there's, there's a sort of question mark how to cash out that internal distinction. It seems at least clear in Aquinas that um, ontologically that can't be the case um, for God. So Aquinas in this respect seems to interpret Pseudo-Dionysius' providential powers from the participant side um, as extrinsic to God. Um, and here I didn't have time for this yet, but something I want to check in the commentary on the De Divinis Nomidibus um, is um, where he cashes out some more of this distinction um, in, in itself. Um, so Aquinas in this first, um, this, uh, first sentence commentary brings out this extrinsic aspect in his interpretation 
of Dionysius's dual affirmation and rejection of being to God. Um, and here reading from text D15. Yet this name, qui est, expresses being, essay, as absolute and not determined through any addition. And Damascene says, therefore, that it does not signify what God is, but as it were an infinite ocean of substance, which is without determination. When therefore we proceed towards God by way of remission, remotion, we first deny of him anything corporeal, and then, and then we even deny of him anything intellectual, according as these are found in creatures, such as goodness and wisdom. And then there remains in our minds only the notion that he is and nothing more, wherefore he exists in a certain confusion for us. Lastly, however, we remove from him even being itself as it is found in creatures, and then he remains in a kind of shadow of ignorance, by which ignorance, insofar as it pertains to this life, we are best united to God, as Dionysius says, and this is the cloud in which God is said to dwell. So on the one hand, God is still infinite essay. However, creatures only partake, partake of essay as it is delimited from their end as finite essay. Um, and we can sort of see that um, extrapolated, um, Aquinas extrapolating that from John Damascus's and by proxy, Nazianzus's um, uh, phrase. Um, however, creatures only partake, partake of essay as it is delimited from their end as finite, as finite essay or ends. So thus God is being as the cause of created being and creatures. And in this respect, God is being that is as infinite to be. Creatures only know and thus participate finite essay. So God is not um, in this specific, specific regard being um, and unparticipated in this respect in relation to creatures and um, in relation to creatures in their, in their um, delimitation of being. So this conception rules out the notion of incipient or imminent plurality in God in the way suggested in um, the passages we've seen in Dionysius and Nicholas. Infinite to be essay rules out this diversity, which implies the limited finitude. So in this particular regard, creatures do not participate God directly, um, a la Plotinus, uh, in the way adapted by Dionysius and Nicholas. However, indirectly, be it received essay as limited by their mode of being. Um, and also, and while saying that on the one hand, at the same time, um, actually, yeah, actually, let's skip that part for now. Um, so to conclude here then, um, on the one hand, Aquinas gets rid of the distinction between uh, one unparticipated principle and many participated principles interpreted as essential beings or separated, separated forms, pointing to Proclus's Henads. So in this respect, he still he follows Nicholas and Pseudo Dionysius. Aquinas still sticks implicitly with Proclus, at the same time, Proclus, uh, Aquinas still sticks with Proclus's three term distinction between the unparticipated, participated, and participants, inasmuch as God in himself remains unparticipated while participated according to the production of essay as delimited in specific creatures. So this gives rise to the apparent diversity of distinct powers like Dionysius's providential powers or Nicholas's distinct illuminations. Um, so in this regard, as it were, um, that participated level as I read is brought down to the level of the participants and sort of in a way the opposite of what happens with Nicholas where it's drawn up towards the um, participated source. Um, yeah, and this is also a yeah, hypothesis. I'm curious to hear, I'd be glad to hear others' feedback. Um, and so just to give a general conclusion, um, if we compare Aquinas and Nicholas's reading of Proclus, we find a number of points where both maintain the same position, yet both take diverging stances on their reading of Pseudo Dionysius and their own formulations of how they respond to Proclus. Both recognize the problem of posing Proclus's distinction. However, they take two different philosophical modes of attack. Nicholas critiques Proclus for saying that the first cause is purely unparticipated and instead suggests that the first cause can be understood as equally participated and unparticipated. Aquinas, by contrast, critiques Proclus's immediate layer of separate principles after the first cause. So the separate forms in Aquinas's terminology um, correlating to Proclus's synads and concludes that they should be dropped where God is the direct cause of all perfections of created beings not just being alone as for the decalces or unity alone as for Proclus' synads. 
In this sense, Pro Aquinas preserves Proclus's distinction from the elements proposition 23, um, it's three, the three term framework, while he yet maintains only two sets of subsisting entities, that is between God and created beings, in contrast to Proclus's um, uh, three term um, framework between the one that him adds the gods and produced beings. Nicholas also maintains two sets of subsisting entities between God and created beings rather than Proclus's three. Yet for Nicholas, it is instead God who is both unparticipated and participated. So God's status as unparticipated reflects God's preexistence before created beings. And also that God does not directly belong either to one or to all created participants, but instead maintains his own distinct being. In turn, God in himself has participated in as much as the powers given to creatures are that through which creatures participate God, while the powers are identified with God. This suggests that Nicholas makes an internal distinction in God between what is unparticipated and participated. So the illuminations given specifically for created beings, while Nicholas fervently maintains God's unity and simplicity um, against the distinctio realis that results in Proclus' one and him adds. Um, so in this regard, we see both a common strategy of trying to deal with um, the, trying to do, trying to deal with um, the the corollary of Proclus's uh, framework for participation overall um, by, that that would lead to polytheism and um, also differing approaches to how one deals with participation in creatures in relation to God. Um, just to some to sort of summarize the whole thing. Um, and yeah, with that, I would appreciate any feedback and that's so far at the end of the paper. So thanks a lot for listening. <laughs>